Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to Elder Law 101. Um, Elder Law 101 is a series of presentations I'm going to do monthly all through 2023. This is the first one um, in which I have tried to assemble all the information that you as a senior need to know to deal with your estate planning and any current issues that you have while you're still alive. Uh, it, it, and so let, let me talk to you a little bit about what the 12 seminars are going to be. Um, the first is going to be, and, but I realize I actually have to read from the screen, so I need my glasses. Um, the first one, which is today, we're going to talk all about my friends Frank and Mary. Throughout this, we're going to talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and then some other folks that I'll talk to you about. Um, this month, we're going to talk about what Frank and Mary needed to do before they hit age 60, what their estate planning concerns might have been and how they needed to address them by the time they're 60. Oftentimes, I'm seeing clients in their 60s who are coming in with estate planning documents that were really meant to deal with that, to deal with what happened when their kids were young, when their kids were growing, how did that all work out? And the question then is really, do their plan, does their plan need to change now that they're getting older? So in the second presentation, we're gonna talk about um, things to consider in your 60s. We're gonna talk about whether any of those plans need to change, because oftentimes at that point, everybody's out of the house, the assets are much greater than they were when the original plan was set up. Um, you, now folks are thinking about, are thinking about when do they wanna uh, um, pull their social security? Do they wanna do it early? Do they wanna do it late? Um, we're, so there are a bunch of issues that you need to focus on in your 60s. Then, in your, in, then dealing with your 70s, by your 70s, by the uh, folks are more concerned about, oh, you know, I'm getting older now. Uh, I need to try to figure out, is there any planning that I need to do ahead of time? Maybe I'm starting to get nervous about, maybe somebody might need a nursing home in the future. Uh, maybe I just want to make sure that I, I'm, maybe I'm considering downsizing. There are a whole number of issues that come up when you're in your 70s. Uh, um, in seminar number four, which is going to be in April, we're going to specifically talk about taxes because it's tax season and so there may be some things that people need to be thinking about but we're going to talk about taxes also more broadly what are all of the issues that seniors need to think about when they're dealing with uh, income with income taxes especially uh, in may uh, for seminar number five we're going to talk about life in your 80s when you really have slowed down and maybe you're starting to have some health problems how do you what are the programs that you need what is the planning that you need to do to deal with those issues? Uh, then I'm going to talk specifically uh, about how, why it is that you can always qualify for Mass Health. That is probably the most common question that comes up with clients who are coming in who are older, uh, who are either worried about can they qualify for Mass Health if, if they need it later on, or can they qualify right now? Uh, in, in July, we're going to have plan, uh, number seven, which is really going to talk about the last of your, your, year of your life, um, which you may know ahead of time because it may be that your health is really deteriorating or it may become sudden. But the point is you get to an age where you know you want to make sure that in the event that your health really starts deteriorating, that, you, that there are some things that you may need to deal with before you die and some things that are kind of unique to being in, those, that, in that, that period of frailty. Um, then, uh, what to do or what somebody needs to do after you die. We're gonna talk about um, uh, estate administration, how the probate process works, what you need to know kind of ahead of time to deal with that, and what you need to know, especially if you're Frank and Mary and you've got older parents, to deal with their um, post-death estate administration issues and perhaps with how to avoid some of those. But, uh, next, we're going to deal with trust administration. So many folks now uh, have trusts that they have created to deal with uh, estate tax minimization or to avoid probate. The question, though, is when they die, how does all of that work? When new trustees come in, how does, how does it work? So we're going to talk about that. Uh, in, 11, in November, we're going to talk about Medicare because it's Medicare month. Everybody, all my clients have got uh, Medicare of some form. Uh, so the question is, what should that form be? And how should seniors every year look at whether they want to change that form of their Medicare? And finally, uh, in December, we're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about giving as well as some tax planning that needs to be done at the end of the year. So we're going to cover a lot of material. Uh, I was joking with my staff. I think we may even want to have an exam at some point to see how people are doing and see if they've 
caught on to all of this. So today, uh, Elder Law 101, seminar number one, incapacity and estate planning before you hit 60. We're gonna talk about, of course, my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. We've often talked about them. For this seminar, we're also going to talk about Mary's sister, whom we have never talked about before, Peggy, or Peg, and her daughter Peggy. So Peg is uh, unmarried. I don't know if she's divorced. I don't know what happened, but she's unmarried. She's a business person. She's doing you know, better than Frank and Mary because she's just worried, but she's also needing to take care of Peggy. So we're gonna talk about Peggy uh, and, and, and we're gonna talk about the unique issues that she faces given the fact that, she, that, she, um, that it is not clear what would happen if she died. So Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. We've talked about them often, but now we're talking about the backstory. What about Frank and Mary when they were 30? when their kids were just little and they were trying to figure out what to do and they were hustling around? Or what, what about Frank and Mary when they were 50, when their kids had gotten older, hadn't gotten out of school yet, right? But they were dealing with college and a bunch of other things. So for Frank and Mary during those years, their estate planning was fairly pretty, well, really pretty stable because among other things, they didn't have a lot of assets, so they didn't need to be worrying about what was going to happen to the assets after they died. Um, we're making, we're taking, we're talking about Frank and Mary right now when they were 50, when they had a house, um, which doesn't have a, a, a lot of value to it yet. Um, and it's got, it, it's got, it's worth, it was worth 50, and remember this was a long time ago, it was worth $50,000, they had a mortgage of 40,000, maybe they had assets of 10, maybe Frank's 401k was $20,000, maybe they had joint savings of $20,000 for a total of $50,000. Actually, this sounds more like Frank and Mary when they were 30 than when they were 50. So the only big asset that they had was their life insurance policy, which is a substantial policy. Uh, in this case, whereas I'm assuming these assets, the house was probably owned by Frank and Mary jointly. The bank accounts were owned by them jointly. Frank's 401k, he named Mary as the death beneficiary. And on the life insurance, he named Mary as the death beneficiary. So in that situation, the question is, what kind of estate planning did they need to do? And, and kind of the short answer was not a lot because if, if when one of the spouses dies, all assets go to the other spouse, um, then, the, then the question is, do, you know, what, what do they need to do? They, they wanna make sure that if both of them die, assets are divided among the children. They certainly wanna make sure because the children are young that in, in that case, the assets are gonna get held by somebody as a trustee for the children. But the, but the point is, um, what is the likelihood of that happen, happening? Uh, many folks in this case will have, will have wills, or actually most people will have wills, right? But those wills will probably never get probated when the first person dies. If all assets are held, any assets that are held jointly by two people when one person dies, that person's interest simply evaporates the other person becomes the sole owner. Uh, for assets like life insurance or 401ks that, are, that in this case would need to have an owner, probably Frank, right? Though they would specify though that when Frank died, the new owner would become, or the, the beneficiary would be Mary. So in all of those cases, there would be no probate. There would also be no estate tax if one spouse died and the other one received all assets because any assets given to a surviving spouse are subtracted from the taxable estate. Therefore, there's really, a, and, and, and the chances of both spouses dying uh, together or even really, really close to each other are unbelievably small, unbelievably small. I have had this happen um, a, a few times regarding folks in their 90s, um, only once regarding folks who were under 60. This was a, you know, just a tragic case that happened many years ago. It was a family, the, the husband it was, it came home late from work, the wife was sleeping, the kids were sleeping. Apparently the husband left the car on by mistake in the garage that was attached and everybody died. Um, uh, it, that was a, a tragic case, but the only case that I've ever heard about, right? So. The, the chances of this occurring are extremely small. So it may be that in that case, Frank and Mary didn't even have a will or didn't have a will and the likelihood of them needing it was very small. The two things that they really had to have, because here there really was a likelihood of something happening, they had to make sure that there was a power of attorney 
and a healthcare proxy. So that if one of them during those years became incapacitated, there was somebody there who could handle that person's financial and other legal issues, that is through the power of attorney, and who, if the doctor said that the incapacitated person couldn't make a medical decision, could make decisions on behalf of that person, that's the healthcare proxy. Those are the only two documents that Frank and Mary really, really, really need to have. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about those briefly because there are also documents that Frank and Mary will need to have as they get older uh, will become and those documents will become increasingly important because as they get older, the likelihood of one of them becoming incapacitated uh, becomes higher and higher. So powers of attorney, it's very simple. If you're in Massachusetts, uh, you do not need witnesses in order to do a power of attorney. A, having the, the power of attorney notarized is preferable. Uh, it is not required unless the power of attorney is being used when someone is recording or, or signing legal documents and getting them recorded on behalf of somebody else. Um, we always recommend though that the power of attorney get notarized and the reason for that is most people don't realize that a power of attorney does not need to be notarized. And so if you go to a bank or an insurance company or whatever with your power of attorney and it's not notarized, it may be that, that the person is gonna look at that power of attorney askance and may not agree to take it. And in that situation, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? If the person who, to, whom, who, to whom you want to give the power of attorney says, oh, I'm not gonna take that one, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna sue them? So what you want is to have the document look as valid, as legally valid as possible. Um, a couple of other things. Don't make the power of attorney springing. Uh, you know, oftentimes folks will say, well, you know, I really only want this power of attorney to be in effect if I really need it, if I'm incapacitated. And, and so I want to put something in the power of attorney that says that. The problem with that is that if you become incapacitated, um, the person to wh whom you have named in your power of attorney may have to go through all kinds of hoops to demonstrate that you become incapacitated. If the, the person goes to the bank with the power of attorney and the, the person at the bank says, well, no, how do I know that the person's been incapacitated? How do you prove that? So, my suggestion, if you're really concerned about that, we, we have had occasion uh, in, in these situations where we would actually hold the powers of attorney ourselves. We tell clients, if you want to, just hold them uh, and make sure that they don't get given to anyone until you're incapacitated. Or some folks will actually have us hold them and give us instructions that we're holding them in escrow. We're holding them pursuant to instructions from the client or, and a lot of times those are pre-existing instructions that say, if, I, if you believe that I become incapacitated, then give this power of attorney uh, document to the person I have named. Um, do two, always do two powers of attorney and, 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 and just in case you lose the original. In, in, in all cases that we, we, de we deal with, we always keep an original just in case an emergency arises and no one can find the, uh, the power of attorney. For more information, by the way, on these powers of attorney in general, um, we're going to do a Bergeron Briefs episode. So one of the ways that, that I figured that we could deal with so many issues that seniors face without having to cram things all in to one of these um, 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 uh, seminar sessions is that, we're, is that I am doing separate filmed Bergeron briefs. I'm calling them Bergeron briefs. Each one will be no longer than 15 minutes. They will each deal more specifically with a topic. In this case, I'm going to do a Bergeron brief, which should be available this month <clears throat> um, regarding powers of attorney. A few more details though on powers of attorney, the finer points. Um, remember that if you've done a power of attorney and you then have decided that you want to use somebody else for whatever reason, Remember, you need to not only do a new one to the new person, you also have to revoke the old one because signing a new power of attorney does not automatically revoke an old power of attorney. So you can end up with two powers of attorney out there at the same time. Um, you want to specify in the power of attorney, or at least consider specifying, giving your attorney the ability to make gifts. That is extremely important uh, for Frank and Mary when they're younger, when typically they're simply going to name each other uh, as the power of attorney agent, <coughs> excuse me, they want to make sure, each one wants to make sure that if one is incapacitated, um, the other has the capacity to shift assets 
to himself or herself uh, for various um, mass health and other uh, asset qualifying uh, reasons. Um, you always want to name an alternate. One of the points of this is to make sure that if Frank or Mary get into a car accident, for example, and are incapacitated, there's someone who can make decisions for them. But what if they're in a car accident together, Frank and Mary? So you always want to name uh, a backup and you want to keep that original in a safe place, right? You don't want to leave it. it I have had cases where people have keep their powers of attorney in their safe deposit box. That's not a great place to keep it because then you can't get to it because you need the power of attorney to tell the bank that you can get into the safe deposit box. So you want to keep it in a, in a safe place. Ideally, um, you may want to leave it if, if you have a, a, if you're naming a child, you want to leave it with your child. Healthcare proxies. Uh, healthcare proxies, once again, the purpose of them is simply to make sure that if your doctor says you can't make a medical decision, there's somebody there who can. Uh, healthcare proxies require two witnesses, no notary. Anybody can be a witness as long as they're not named as one of the healthcare proxy agents. Uh, they're only valid if your attorney says that you can't make a medical decision and they're only invalid until your, your, your excuse me, not your attorney, until your, it, they're valid if your doctor says that you can't make a decision, a medical decision, and they stay valid until your doctor says that you're back. You know, you had that operation and now you're on the mend and you can, can, you can make medical decisions. Every time you sign one, it revokes all old ones. So if you have a, a healthcare proxy that you did with your attorney, then you go to the hospital for, for, for an emergency and the hospital says, so just sign this healthcare proxy, we need it while you're here. Technically, by signing that, you revoked the old one. So the better practice is once you have the healthcare proxy, give that healthcare proxy to your doctor who is required under state law to put it in your medical record and that way your doctor can get it to the emergency room if you have an emergency. Healthcare proxies don't cross state lines. Each state has its own healthcare proxy rules. So if you're traveling to a particular place, like if you go to Florida on vacation, you may want to have a separate Florida healthcare proxy. Ha executing that Florida one does not revoke your Massachusetts one. <coughs> Excuse me, regarding healthcare proxies, copies are typically okay. Um, you always want to name an alternate for the same reason you want to name an alternate on the powers of attorney. Um, once again, for more information on this, I, did, I do more detailed discussion of this in a uh, Bergeron Briefs episode. Now, so if you're Frank and Mary, you may or may not want to have a will um, that specifies that, that how the assets get dealt with in the event that the two of you have died, just because the likelihood of that happening is very small. If you're a peg though, and you're single, then maybe you really do want to make sure that all that everything is very clear about what happens if you die. Because if you die, who's there? Just Peggy. So you really you want to figure that out. Whether you know your 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 Peg and your age 30, and Peggy is still really little, right? Uh, or whether you're Peg and your age 50, and maybe uh, at that point Peggy is in college. And so she's you know, older, but maybe not old enough to handle the substantial assets that would show up because remember, assume that, that Peg has that life insurance policy. So assume that um, Peg has been doing, has been accumulating more assets than, than, um, than uh, Frank and Mary have, that she's a, uh, out there, she's a professional, she's got a house that's got some equity, she's got a 401k that's starting to grow and some savings. But most importantly, like um, her sister Mary, she has a life insurance policy. But in this case, the, the, the life insurance policy is for a million dollars and where is it going to go after she dies? So what is Peg's estate plan? In, in this case, certainly, uh, Peg needs a will to make sure that, that, that things happen appropriately uh, when she dies, unless there is an alternative way of handling Peg's assets. She wants to make sure, the reason why she needs a will uh, specifically is no matter how the assets are being handled in that will, she can specify um, who will be the guardian for Peggy if Peggy is under age 18. Um, she may also want to have a trust. Um, the key thing about that trust is she wants to make sure that the trust, she wants to name, she wants to figure out who the new trustee is going to be. Is it going to be Mary? Is it going to be another relative? Who's it going to be? Uh, she wants to figure out when the final distributions to Peggy are going to occur. She wants to make sure she's specified the rules regarding how the trustee is going to handle those assets until Peggy is old enough to handle them by herself. 
she may very well want to create a revocable and amendable trust. Um, oftentimes people of, of all ages will come in to me and say, you know, I, I think I need a trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? Well, they'll say, I don't, I don't know. It's because everybody has told me that I need a trust. Well, in some cases that is the case, right? In the case of Frank and Mary, it really isn't the case unless both of them have died. And once again, the chances of that happening are very small. In, Peggy, in Peg's case though, the need for a revocable trust may be more, um, more important um, because the, the possibility that she might just die and leave things um, to, to Peggy is just greater. So the question is, what is a revocable trust? Revocable means whatever you put into it, you can always take back out of it. It's very simple. Uh, um, and it's revocable, but you also want to make it amendable so that while Peg is alive, Peg can change the rules of the trust at any time. Peg would typically become the trustee of the trust for the benefit of herself as a beneficiary and also for the benefit of Peggy. For tax purposes, this is a so-called grantor taxable trust. So even though she has put her property in, into trust, for example, her house, for tax purposes, it's as if she still owns the property. So if she sells the property, she still gets the capital gains exclusion as, as long as she's lived in the property for two of the previous five years. If she dies, um, the so-called tax basis of her property will jump to the date of death value, uh, even if it, had, it, it just as it would have if she were single. So that if, if, the, if the trustee for Peggy's benefit then sells the house, there'll be no capital gains tax. So the, the, the trust is, is tax neutral. For that reason, she also doesn't have to, if she creates the trust, get a special tax ID number. She doesn't have to be filing special income tax returns every year. Um, so, so there are no real, real disadvantages to structuring things this way while she is alive. But when she dies, because the property is in trust, the asset will not go into probate. Any asset that Peg owns that is only in her name, that does not have a named death beneficiary if she dies, will otherwise have to go through the probate process. If Peg has a will, at the end of that process, those assets will go according to the terms of the will. If Peg has no will, the, the assets will go according to the, the, the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply when there is no will. In this case, both would be the same. If she dies, all assets will go to Peggy. The problem with probate, though, is that before assets can be distributed to a beneficiary, creditors have to get paid. Creditors have one year from date of death in order to file a claim against the probate estate, which is why probate always takes at least a year and a day. That's probably the major reason why most people uh, will, will, who, who, will, who are not simply holding assets jointly with someone will set up a revocable and amendable trust. Because when she dies, ideally there will be no probate of any, in, on any of the trust assets. And as long as she has specified that the trust will be the beneficiary of all of her other assets, like her 401k and her life insurance, everything will simply flow into that, into that um, trust and will be governed by the rules of that trust. So some of the, the issues regarding the revocable trust though, that, that Peg will wanna, be, will wanna consider will be, for example, uh, if she dies, who will be the new trustee? In this case, maybe she wants to make, make her sister marry the trustee or somebody else. Um, when will assets finally get distributed to Peggy? At what age? We typically recommend age 25, but you can really pick any age. Who controls the assets in the mean? Any, are there any special controls in the meantime? Does Mary, as the successor trustee, have to make any reports to any third parties so that the third parties can make sure that Mary is using the assets appropriately? Um, what if Mary can't do it? Uh, because it could be that Peggy will live for quite a while, Maybe Peg wants to name a successor trustee if Mary can't do it. Um, what if Peggy gets sick? What if assets are already in trust and then Peg has an accident um, may, and, and is incapacitated for a time? At that point, she may want to specify that, that Mary, as Peg's sister, will automatically become the new trustee, at least for a time. Or she may want to specify that whoever she's named on her power of attorney will become the new trustee. So there are a number of asset of, of issues that should be considered regarding um, um, revocable and amendable trust. Once again, I'm going to do a special Bergeron briefs to deal with any of these issues, just in case. Finally, 
Peg may have some issues in, in terms of wanting to make sure that she's minimizing possible estate taxes. Because if Peg dies, leaving the asset, over, assets of over a million dollars, there will be an estate tax. All of the assets that I've named, the life insurance proceeds, the house, everything, all the assets and trust, everything will be included in the taxable estate, even if it's not in the probate estate. If the assets are more than a million dollars, the initial Massachusetts estate tax rate is 40% of dollars over a million. If she dies with assets of a million one hundred fifty thousand dollars, her, her estate tax will be $45,840. There is a way that, that Mary can avoid all of that and guarantee that it will be avoided, uh, excuse me, that Peg can avoid all of that. She'd need to do that by creating something called an islet or an irrevo irrevocable life insurance trust. I'm not gonna get into the details of that. I'm doing a separate Bridgeron briefs um, on that. So, um, I, I, if you have any questions on any of this, you can watch this show again on my, um, my, my, uh, on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, uh, or obviously you can watch, watch it again uh, um, through the, the, your local cable station, uh, or you can call me if you've got any questions at 508-860-1470. Remember the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. If you've got an issue, if any of this is keeping you, is, is, is causing you to lose sleep, or if you've got kids and you think that they're in this situation and they should be doing some estate planning, talk to them. Thank you very much and I'll see you next month.